Well, kia ora, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this ASB virtual event, the Home Ownership Webinar Series. It's lovely to see you all. I'm Hilary Barry, and I am delighted to be with you with our Home Ownership Webinar Series, an ASB virtual event. I would like to extend a big virtual welcome to everyone right up and down the country who's joining us this evening. A big double hand wave to you all. We're going to have a really, really interesting time together. Uh, we've got an hour together, we've got some great speakers, and we'll get to your burning questions a little bit later on as well. Now, I want to quickly talk about the purpose of these events. ASB really wants to help Kiwis through these tough times and connect homeowners and home buyers with industry experts who can really assist by sharing their views on home ownership at this time. So to tell you a bit more about the purpose of this session, this is the first episode in a three-part series. Tonight, we will discuss what's happening in the housing market in the current environment. You're gonna hear from our experts as they talk about home ownership, COVID-19, the dreaded COVID-19, ASB's response, and a global and national economic perspective with the data to support it. Next week's episode is especially for first home buyers. So we're going to dig into that topic a little bit more in a bit more detail then. And our third session in the series the week after will dive into the things homeowners should be thinking about right now. Now a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get underway. As an attendee, you will notice that you're on mute and your video is turned off. That is not because we don't want to hear from you. We do. But we've given you access to the Q&A section, and we're going to run a live session with your questions a little bit later on. So for those of you who have provided questions during registration, we're going to make sure that we do our very, very best to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. And if you've got any other questions, put them in the Q&A section that you will find either on your bottom panel, like down there, get your little mouse out and have a hover, it'll be down there, or it might be up there. So again, get your mouse or get your little finger out if you're on your iPhone, something like that, and have a little look. But you can all ask questions on that. Um, normally, of course, at this stage, if I was to host an event this big, and we'd all be together, but we can't be together, but that's okay, because we're thinking of new ways to do things, uh, the MC's job would be, of course, to point out where the loos are and the fire escapes are. Since you're in your own homes, I'm picking that you probably know where the loo is, and since your video is switched off, we're not going to have any embarrassing moments, so that's good. Uh, the other thing, too, is if you do need to evacuate your home, revert to your fire escape plan. If you're on a mobile device, take us with you, and then you can keep up to date. A win-win. It is now my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Craig Sims. He is ASB's Executive General Manager of Retail, and Craig has been with ASB for 18 months. And judging from the size of his bookshelves, he is a keen reader, which we would all agree is probably very handy in lockdown. Craig will be going over a high-level overview of the current state of the nation and an ASB retail overview of how ASB is managing and responding. Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Hilary. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this new way tonight. Uh, well, COVID-19 certainly changed the way that we interact with each other. As Hilary said, normally we're going to do this pre-lockdown. We'd be in the same room having a bit of fun together. Tonight we can't. So whilst we can't connect in person, we're really pleased we can speak to more people across the country. And so thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to, to join us tonight. So turning to the topic tonight about the housing market, pre-COVID, it was steaming along, house prices were hitting all-time highs. And as you're going to hear from our speakers, the, um, some of the regions were in what we would call boom territory in terms of their prices. Um, and so what happened though, obviously, as COVID came along, the lockdown happened, and all the drivers of the housing market changed. And you're gonna hear them tonight in terms of the labor market, the confidence around employment, net migration, and obviously during lockdown, the number of uh, listings on the market to have a look at. So we'll talk about that as we go through. So as ASB responded to COVID-19, we, like many other businesses, focus fundamentally on our safety of our customers and our staff. And then also how do we help support our staff through this? We want to make sure that our customers had immediate support and relief and financial assistance that they needed. 
uh, and some of that included access to mortgage deferrals or um, principal uh, relief, just to help people to get through. Um, now, while some of those things work in the short term, we know that they can increase the amounts you repay over the long term. And that's why as a bank, we make sure we take everyone's individual circumstances to heart and we provide the right relief for them and we give them good advice and guidance so that they get the best financial outcome over the long haul. Now, as we move through the alert levels and we got more confident on the health side, the bank, our partners, the regulators, we all looked and see how could we safely restart the economy. And you would have heard in mid -May, early May that the Reserve Bank uh, removed the lending uh, loan to value restrictions, LVRs as we call them. Those LVR restrictions restrict the amount of lending that banks can do to customers who have less than 20% deposit. And so, as we've seen those release, we've also seen a lot of customers reach out to us, talk about their mortgage, or inquire about what these LVRs mean for their buying aspirations. Now, the Reserve Bank, in announcing that, highlighted that one of the reasons for that was to help with financial stability and remove one potential impediment to the flow of credit through the economy to help as a buffer against a potential downturn. And now, we fully support those uh, recommendations and actions by the Reserve Bank. I would stress that we're not gonna rush out though and suddenly do no, do no deposit home loans for everybody. We wanna make sure that uh, we're supporting our customers but in a safe uh, way over the long term. So the um, other thing that ASB is doing to support people on the home buying aspirations is make sure that we've got some great rates in the marketplace and you would have seen our two year 2.99% rate that helps people already in the market, but also helps people who are looking to get their next home buying aspiration. So whilst COVID may have changed how we're interacting, it doesn't change our commitment to helping you with your home buying aspirations uh, and how we can make sure we're supporting you on taking the necessary steps to your next home purchase. So with that, uh, I'll uh, step back. I'm looking forward to hearing about the market from the twin mix, Mick Goodall and uh, Aaron McTuffley, and I'll join you back at the end of the Q&A. And uh, Hilary, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you so much for your insight there. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, though, before you go, you've got a large book collection there. Anything you'd recommend? Yeah, mostly the wife's actually. <laughs> but, um, the, good, the, the good one that you'd really want to look at is uh, up there is a Stig Larson, uh, the girl with the golden, uh, with the, oh, the dragon tattoo. Dragon tattoo. Too. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you so much. We will talk to you a little bit later um, when we come back to our Q&A. Right, it is my absolute delight now to uh, introduce you to Chief Economist, ASB Chief Economist, Nick Tuffley, who's here this evening as well. Nick Hales from Canterbury but he's an Aucklander at heart he's been with ASB for 13 years Nick is going to be sharing a global perspective in the current environment of COVID-19 he's going to give us an update on the national economic and housing market outlook and give us some detail too on the regional specifics and remember if you do have any burning questions uh, for Nick or Craig do put them in the Q&A area on screen over to you Nick the virtual floor is yours Thank you very much, Hilary. Um, good evening, everybody. Now I'll just get my screen up and and we'll we'll get um, sharing away. So some of the key things that I wanted to um, talk about this evening. Uh, I'll really look at that wider global backdrop and just give us a sense of what is happening in the in, in the world at the moment. Uh, a little bit of a sketch of it and talk a little bit about um, COVID nineteen because I'll. Ultimately, that's going to be determining where economies do go because it's all about the behavioural changes and government responses that we're seeing. And then talk through a bit more about some of those more fundamental housing market uh, aspects. So just on the wider economy, look, when we're looking at um, the world economy at the moment, look, we're all in a world of pain. We're all uh, experiencing these shutdowns as we respond to the virus. I think New Zealand, Australia and a number of countries in Asia have done a, a really good job of getting on top of the virus and had low uh, rates of cases, low death rates uh, and fingers crossed here in New Zealand we are pretty close to um, eradicating or eliminating uh, COVID-19 as well. 
but when you start going through Europe, uh, and particularly the United States, you've seen some really high infection rates and very, very large death rates as well. And of course, all the economic decimation that's coming along with that is, as well. So you can see from uh, that chart I've got up, when we're looking at the growth in our key trading partners, it's taking quite a hit this year. So two and a half, three percent decline uh, for in our key trading partners. And that's much more substantial than what we saw during in the global financial crisis. And at the moment, the expectation is that there'll be quite a rebound that comes through next year. I think the thing we've got to bear in mind is there's all sorts of scenarios ahead. Uh, if countries get on top of the virus, then their economies will start recovering and be able, be able to shake off some of the avoidance behaviours that we go through over time. Uh, but if we do find that the virus is hanging around for a long period of time, or it takes a long time to get a virus, uh, sorry, a vaccine in place, then that does mean that that recovery could be a lot slower. So a lot of uncertainty on the way going through, but in the short term, we and other countries are being hit by a very, very sharp uh, downturn all at the same time. So it's a really unusual uh, experience for all of us, and hopefully one will never have to go through again in our lifetimes. So we're looking at New Zealand's growth. Uh, what you can see there is, is look, we're looking at about a contraction in the economy, which is um, you know, pushing somewhere over to around that sort of seven percent mark or so. Now that's pretty phenomenal when you go back to the global financial crisis. The economy shrank by less than three percent during that period, uh, and it was over eighteen months. Now we're doing that almost in a matter of um, or less than eighteen weeks, even. So it's a very, very, very challenging time. You know, you'd struggle to go back through to our over our modern history to find a time like this where our economy has been so disrupted um, by this. So very, very unusual time and that's a big deep dip. When we're looking at just the, the second quarter, we're talking about a contraction of anywhere between 15 and 25 percent uh, and our forecast is about midway through that. Now when you're normally used to having good quarterly growth being about one percent, when you're talking about a contraction that's well into double digits, that's just a, a very, very different world entirely. So we'll be spending much of the rest of this year from now digging our way back out of that deep hole that we've dug and next year starting to um, recover a bit further. Uh, going forward. Now, if we look at some of the housing fundamentals, obviously one of the key things is, is um, the reason why we have houses is so that people have got somewhere to live. Uh, so the faster your population growth, obviously, the stronger your um, demand for housing as well. So we've gone from several years of incredibly strong net immigration. So the, the flow of people coming into New Zealand has been very strong compared to the, the flow that we have going out to, to other countries. But obviously when you closed your borders and anybody coming, coming here has got to go through quarantine on the way through uh, and into an economy where you know, jobs are going to be more challenging to get, we're not going to be getting quite the same degree of, sort of new immigrants coming into New Zealand that we have had in the past. We're still likely to get some people coming through there, probably mainly returning New Zealanders coming back to somewhere where it's a, a bit safer and where it makes sense to spend all the time in quarantine as well. And we're also likely to see fewer New Zealanders leaving to go elsewhere as well. But it still adds up to very likely a period where population growth is going to be slower. So that means that that need to be building homes rapidly will disappear a little bit. Places like Auckland, which accounts for about 50% of that net immigration, we're obviously going to see the population slow um, quite a bit uh, through here. But on the other side of the coin, that's the supply side. Um, for Auckland, where it's struggled over the last 10 years or so to build enough homes to house everybody who's arriving here, it does mean that that shortfall of supply that we've got will get eaten up a little bit quicker. So when we're looking at what's happening in Auckland anyway, that immigration story will be very, very important. Uh, it just generally means that we'll, we'll get to a point where we've caught up and we've got enough homes a lot quicker than what we've had in the past. But it certainly is a very big change from a New Zealand point of view to see that immigration uh, slow down. And another bit we're going to have to be mindful of is, and we're already starting to see this, is you know, we are inevitably seeing a lot of the job losses coming through, particularly in areas that are exposed to tourism. That's, that's where a lot of the epicenter for our downturn is. But there's also just the sheer impacts of the financial pressure of businesses going through the lockdown period and some sectors like hospitality taking longer to recover as well. So we are likely to see quite a lot of job losses coming, coming through. So we're expecting that unemployment will be rising from the low 4% 
to somewhere between 9 and 10 percent in a very short space of time. So that does mean we've got a lot of people who will be um, getting quite a hit to their income, being very, very cautious and obviously not able to get into the market uh, and be focusing on coming to banks like ourselves to make sure that they can uh, continue to hold on to their house during the downturn as well. It also means a lot of people are going to be quite cautious about buying. They're going to want to make sure that they are confident in their financial security before committing to, to buying a house. So we are likely to find that this is going to be an environment for the next little while where some people will be cautious. And that does mean that some of that pool of people who would ordinarily be going out buying homes are going to be holding back for a little bit longer, which obviously means a little bit less competition for everybody else trying to buy as well. So that will be one other influence that we'll see on prices uh, over time. Now interest rates are a very important part of the affordability equation. So we have seen interest rates plunge and Craig talked about how low some of our, our interest rates have been going. So these are really, if we, if we went back into the, the 1960s, which is where there's some general records for New Zealand, look, we've very clearly got the lowest mortgage rates since at least then. So this is how unusual this crisis is at the moment. Now the flip side of these low interest rates, of course, is, is that anybody getting into the market now, as, as Craig pointed out, those debt servicing costs have been falling and are very, very low. And that's despite the fact that house prices are very high and the amount of debt that New Zealand households collectively have is fairly high as well. So interest rates are making that debt burden really manageable for people who already have a house. It's likely to free up cash flow for those who still have, have jobs. And it also means that entry into the market is going to be pretty, uh, a lot easier as well. So where does this take us and the rubber hits the road for the outlook for house prices? Look, in general, we do expect prices will be falling back a bit over the course of this year. Um, now, somewhere in the order of about 5 to 10% is, is our forecast. Um, you'll hear forecasts that will be a bit, a bit more on the stronger side than that. Um, just when I go back to the global financial crisis, we saw prices fall around 10% during during that, that period, and that was a time of incredibly high interest rates going into it. We also did have job losses at the time, but it was called a global financial crisis for a reason, uh, and that did mean that the financial sector was hurting and credit was nowhere near as easy to get as it is at the moment as well. So that's just something to bear in mind as well. Most regions are going to be hit reasonably by the same sorts of similar impacts. It's the, the job insecurity um, as a key example, and that caution will flood through to a lot of places. We'll see some slight regional differences. Auckland will be one of the areas where we're just seeing that switch go from a flood of people coming in to slower um, population growth will be a bit more noticeable here in Auckland. Areas such as Queenstown, we're likely to find that prices are going to be falling more noticeably than pretty much anywhere else, given the high exposure to tourism there. Places like Wellington, uh, you can imagine there's a lot of people in Wellington who are quite busy at the moment because the government's going to be working pretty hard over the next, uh, next little while, and that does have that buffer of central government. We're going to have some of our export sectors feeling things in different ways. We do actually see areas like dairy being pretty resilient. Um, our horticulture industry that would be influencing Hawke's Bay looking very, very strong, for example, uh, over the next little while. So there'll be some regional variations down to those regional fortunes um, going ahead, but generally we'll see some degree of price pressure coming through over the next little while. And it's just very simple. Um, income insecurity, weaker incomes, um, slower population growth both on, on the one hand, but a bit of a bolster from interest rates being low on the other hand. And in places like Auckland uh, and Wellington as well, you've, had, you've been trying to catch up and build enough homes to meet the needs of everybody. So those are a few things to consider through there and I'll hand back to Hilary now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Very interesting insights there. And uh, I just had a question from Lisa pop through. She wanted to know how does the global market affect the funding for lending? How do the potential negative interest, interest rates impact on not only lending, but interest rates on investment and cash holdings with ASB? Well, just very general, when we're, when we're talking about um, negative interest rates, we're usually talking about the central bank interest rates, which impact on on wholesale markets more than anything. So if we do see slightly negative interest rates in New Zealand, and the Reserve Bank here has ruled them out until early next year at, at least, 
Um, what it might mean is some of the wholesale rates might turn negative. At a customer level, what it might mean is, is that if our funding costs are able to come down, it will mean that some of those customer rates could come down a bit further. Uh, but they're unlikely to go below zero. Certainly deposit rates are very unlikely to go below zero um, because most people do have an alternative called the mattress, um, which would start paying a higher rate of interest than the bank um, if interest rates went below zero for deposits. But if we're not getting our deposit rates down below zero, it also means that our lending rates are likely to remain above zero. So negative interest rates, uh, set by central banks, the effect of them usually is to just help lower customer interest rates, they're a little bit closer towards zero. But obviously there's a limit as to how far interest rates can go negative even in those wholesale markets. Thank you for that. And Brendan just had uh, a quick, a double question actually. Uh, the first part of it was, who has CDs anymore? And B, what are you listening to? <laughs> Oh, well, that's sort of one of the, one of the benefits of uh, being in lockdown is you get to unpack the boxes that you've uh, you've had stored up for 30 years. So um, hence the 30-year stereo and the 30-year uh, CDs behind them. Um, what am I listening to? I still love some good 80s, um, sort of like um, hard rock um, through there. So I'll, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to embarrass myself too much further. 80s hard rock was embarrassing enough. Thank you so much, Nick Tuffley. We'll come back to you a little bit later uh, when we do our Q&A. We're going to move on to uh, Nick Goodall from CoreLogic. He's Head of Research, uh, and he's our last guest speaker for the evening. Nick is going to share his insights through some of the data CoreLogic provides that'll help you understand the trends and what we're seeing in the housing market at this time. Hi, Nick. Great to see you. Take it away. Hi, Ellie. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, looks like a very brief intro. I'm just going to share my screen now, so hopefully that's worked all fine. Brief intro to who CoreLogic are. We um, are a property data and analytics company, and we support the likes of the banks as well as real estate agents who obviously need some pretty quality property market data or property data to be able to do their jobs. And that's a key part of what CoreLogic do. And at the research team, we take all that data along with the economic stuff to try and really paint that picture of what's happening in the market to help educate and help people make smarter decisions. So I'm just gonna work through a few slides today um, and hope you find them very useful for your own situation. So firstly, in terms of somewhat of an agenda, today I'm just going to take you through what was the state of the market leading into the lockdown. Of course, the momentum, where that's at, is going to help us to understand how things might be around the country afterwards. And then, of course, where are things at right now? What, what really fast-moving data do we have right now that's telling us about the market? And where do we expect things to go in the future? Of course, a bit of, quite a bit of uncertainty at the moment. Um, so we try and use all the data we can to, to get a good feel for where things are likely to head. So what was the state of the market pre-lockdown? Looking at most of our main centres here and provincial centres, what we're focusing on is what was the growth at the right-hand side of that chart on the left-hand side. You can see the Auckland at the top there did go through a period of flat growth or no growth really, a little bit of a decrease at the start of 2019 before things started to gain some momentum at the end of last year and even into the start of 2020, while many of the other main centres also saw pretty healthy growth over the last couple of years. Dunedin itself and an orange line on that left-hand chart there, you can see actually reached 20% annual growth um, up to the end of March. So very strong growth, strong momentum in that market. And many of these areas that had strong growth um, were really influenced by having low listings. Not many properties for sale, relatively strong demand, and that means you see prices grow. The fact that we've got low listings is going to mean there might be some price pressure held over, and those people who were looking to buy property prior to the lockdown and have had no change in their financial situation, they may well continue to try and look out there and buy. And we sort of saw a bit of this last weekend, entered level two, very strong numbers at some open homes, and, and that will see some areas see a little bit of momentum continue. But of course, as Nick sort of painted that picture, you know, we are gonna see some, some, some pain in the short to medium term, as we do see large unemployment and the GDP growth slow down. Around some of our provincial centers as well, you can see those ones on the right hand side. Some of those smaller centers, the more affordable when you look at the average value there in the three or four hundred thousands. Wanganui, Gisborne, and Bacargo, strong growth, 20 to 30 percent in those areas. And they may well see some pent up demand continue um, in the early parts of, of level two and into level one as well. While areas like Queenstown, again, we know that its reliance on, on the um, tourism industry is going to mean a little bit of extra weakness for Queenstown. Momentum in terms of growth of the property market leading into the lockdown was very slow as well, was very weak. 1.9% annual growth 
and that was impacted by the things like the foreign buyer ban, which came in in October 2018, which saw a reduction in demand if the prices weren't growing at the same rate. So there's going to be differences across the country, and that will be dictated somewhat by where we saw strong growth leading into the lockdown. In terms of who was active, we, we classify every single purchase in the country by who was active, first home buyers or investors. And good to know, obviously, you know, who else is active in the market that you might be acting in. So nationwide, what we've seen over the recent history, last couple of quarters as a quarterly series, is that light blue line on the chart on the left hand side is investors who are buying and using a mortgage to secure that purchase. We've seen the growth of that, that group of buyers um, over the last sort of three or four quarters and that to the point where they're at 25% of all sales nationwide. Not quite as strong as what they were prior to some of the LVR restrictions uh, three or four years ago, but certainly a lift on where they'd been the last two years. And we've seen first home buyers hold their own as well. A little bit of a dip in Q1, but they have certainly strengthened their position over the last you know, five or six years since they took a dip when the original LVR speed limits came in in 2013, requiring every first home buyer, every owner occupier to have a 20% deposit when you purchase that property, which we know, as uh, Chris mentioned at the start, those LBR limits have all been temporarily removed um, from the Reserve Bank anyway, but of course the banks will themselves have some level of limit that they will apply themselves. And from an investor perspective as well, the right hand side tells us that it's the small time investors, it's those mum and dad investors who have continued and actually strengthened their position in the market. Those people who are buying their first investment or a second investment property maybe, they are the ones that have really picked up on their activity most recently. Moving on then, the other things we're looking at in terms of where strong momentum has actually um, been gaining for the property market leading into the lockdown, we're really looking at affordability. A couple of measures of affordability, one of them is the blue line here, which tells you what is the house price relative to income. And you can see it's quite high in a relative historical sense, but it is slightly below where it was say two years ago. And that's mostly due to easing of prices and income actually catching up a little bit. What we're really interested in at the moment is that orange line, and it's a serviceability rate. So it's how much people, how much of people's income are they using to service their mortgage, purely influenced by their income compared to um, interest rates. So how much they have to pay in interest and their mortgage to their bank. And you can see there over the last you know, 10, 15 years there, it's actually relatively low. It's, it's below the long-term average, and it's certainly below where we were at the GFC. And that's because mortgages are relatively serviceable compared to prior because we've got such low interest rates at the moment. So that means that people do have a bit of maneuverability to be able to afford the home they currently own as long as they've still got some form of income coming in. And of course, we know that there's been the options of mortgage deferral, so having to pay no mortgage um, for a period of time. Of course, you still have to pay that money back in the future, just no payments for a six month period, up to a six month period, or moving to an interest only period. So reducing the payments, so it would be less than 30% is the current average. So that also means we're in a pretty strong position and there won't be as many people who are forced into selling their property because of the current downturn at the moment. So where are we at now? Look, you know, when all this hit, most of the data that, you know, we and the banks and the economists have is all backward looking. Where have we come from? What's the state of the market? Not so much of what's happening right now and where are things going to go in the future. But we do have a couple of unique data sets that we track and those are things like agents who run an appraisal on the value of a property for someone that's potentially going to list their property, and looking at the number of those that are being run. So we're tracking those at the moment to understand how healthy the market is, what listings are likely to do. So the number of um, appraisals that are being generated by agents is a good lead indicator for listings coming to market. And so we get a really early picture of what might come onto the market for those people that are wanting to buy, to sell, and also to get a feel for how many people actually can list their property, whether it's through being stressed or forced, or just people typically going through a change in their circumstances. And so you can see by this chart, of course, we saw a massive dip. We went into lockdown, very difficult to transact property in lockdown. And so agents weren't doing those appraisals. But as soon as we hit level three at the end of um, April, we did see a significant lift in those. And we're still seeing a, a continuation of that lift, although not quite at the same rate. Over the last seven days, we've seen a 2% lift from the prior, seven days prior to that. So still seeing a bit of a lift, but it is slowing down, certainly. We're probably reaching some form of a norm, I would say, now. Um, so we're expecting to see that lift continue and hold pretty strong with listings as well, new listings coming to market. Speaking of listings, looking at new listings data, you'll see a pretty similar trend here, the massive drop away as people didn't bother listing their property in lockdown level four. But as we came out of it, level three, now into level two, we've seen that come back and probably showing signs of that plateau. This is a weekly series. And so you can see there, 
historical average of the last three years for the number of new properties coming to market. We're a little bit below that, but um, not too far away. And so we're not seeing a sign of massive stressed um, owners coming to market trying to list their property to get out of the way. And that's probably because they're being helped out by having those mortgage deferrals, being able to go to interest only as well. Moving on as well, when you look at the state of the market, you know, the reason we're not seeing massive um, forced sales or people really stressed is because we've had such strong support from both the government, the Reserve Bank, and also from the banks themselves. And that is massive support from the government in the form of wage subsidies, the fiscal package, you know, business finance schemes helping our businesses as well, you know, over $50 billion in this, in this area. So really helping out the economy in the short term. The OCR, the official cash rate um, from the Reserve Bank, has been dropped to 0.25%, so the lowest it's ever been, and will hold there for at least 12 months. So again, holding those interest rates down, which means that we do have lower retail interest rates as well, so lower mortgage rates for those people that want to buy a property or those that are coming to refix their mortgage as well. And then the quantitative easing from the Reserve Bank, which essentially, you know, um, is just going to keep interest rates lower for longer as they buy government bonds and keep interest rates low to keep the economy going. Um, to keep people borrowing. And of course, the other restrictions we've spoken about being temporarily removed for at least the next 12 months, and they'll be re-looked at later by the Reserve Bank, depending on what happens in the economy and depending on what happens in the housing market too. And we have seen those flow through to mortgage interest rates now below 3%. And just got some stats there on the number of people that have taken those mortgage deferrals and gone to interest-only terms, over 50,000 in each. And so the key question is going to be when these run out, three, six months time potentially, what's going to happen to those people that are on those terms, they may come to a big decision about what they're going to have to do with their homes. And that's where we may see, you know, people have to accept lower prices for their homes, uh, maybe later on this year, September, October time, depending on their, their financial situation. Of course, they may have changed jobs, they may be okay in their financial situation and, and be okay with moving to normal mortgage terms as well. So that's what we're certainly watching out for, is what happens when a lot of support runs out. What are we expecting to happen? Look, when you look at um, the number of sales, the volume of sales, of course we know that's gonna drop away. We saw from Real Estate Institute numbers for April, an 80% drop in the number of properties that turned over in April compared to the, pro the same month the last year. And over the course of the year, we're expecting a drop of about 20,000 over the year. So from about 85,000 to 65,000 over the year. And that's gonna impact the market. People that rely on the turnover of properties will obviously see an impact to their business. And we don't expect values to have the same um, take the same hit and you saw from Nick, Nick's uh, slides earlier as well the, the expectation of maybe a five or ten five to ten percent drop in price prices or house values um, over the next year as well not not quite the same level of drop we would see in the the volumes and we're trying to get a picture of what value of volume what value sorry are doing right now very difficult to get a feel on this because we've only had that one month of data and it was one month of only um, you know, very few transactions happening because we couldn't really transact property. What we have done on the left-hand side looks at the Real Estate Institute's house price index, and you can see there over the month, there was a minor dip in prices, but of course with so few sales, it's hard to read too much into that. We'd like more data before we, we think that things are turning around or turning down too much. What we have done is look to Australia, and the good thing about comparing to Australia is that their lockdown level through April and even in now in May has been much more similar to maybe a two and level two and a half for New Zealand. So now that we're more moving into level two ourselves, um, we can pretty feel for what's happening in Australia over the last six weeks is what we might see happening for us in New Zealand um, in the last couple of weeks and moving over the next couple of weeks as we are in level two and hopefully, fingers crossed, moving to level one sometime soon. And what you can see from the data is yeah, things have essentially tracked sideways. So there hasn't been a massive dip in any of those areas um, over the month but essentially things track sideways. So we'd expect that in the short term, prices to hold relatively steady before we maybe see dips start to happen later on in the year. That's uh, me for um, this evening, other than um, questions, which I'm happy to answer after this, really just summarizing the stuff we've spoken about today. And to give a quick plug for our podcast, we do you know, track all the data that's coming out weekly. Calvin and I, who's our senior property economist at CoreLogic, you can subscribe to that on any podcast player that you can use um, to hear our thoughts every week uh, for what's going on in the property market. So please head along and do that. And we also have lots of articles on our website. So yeah, please check that out. Otherwise, I'll leave it there and hand back to Hillary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, we will get into the Q&A very quickly. But just before we do that, um, quick question. Is that a virtual background you've got going there? Because it looks very much like your offices. 
I'd love to claim that, yes, I've had an excellent virtual background, but now I've come into the office tonight. Probably best to get out of the madhouse house at home. I've got a very young family, five-year-old, a three-year-old, and an 11-week-year-old. 11 11-week, oh. sorry. So, uh, yeah, pretty mad there. I couldn't guarantee I wouldn't have a, a toddler storming through the door halfway through this as my wife tries to put the, the baby to bed. So, yes. Some papers from the office. Is this the first time you've been to the office? Indeed, yeah. Coming, coming myself, all alone and myself. And uh, nice to be in a very quiet uh, place at the moment. And, yeah, very clean as well. So it's nice. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Nick. Um, we're going to use the final part of our time together to get through some of the questions. Remember, a number, of the, a number of these were submitted by you during the registration process, and others of you have been submitting questions through the live chat Q&A. So we've been busy collating all of those, and I'm going to try hard to make sure that I direct these questions to the right people. Uh, Craig Sims, we've got a question in from Francis. Uh, she asks, with a lot of first-time buyers with us this evening, there are a lot of questions being asked about the Reserve Bank lifting the LPR restrictions. Is it a good time for first-time buyers to buy? And what does a typical deposit look like for a first-home buyer now? Francis, thank you for asking that question. Yes, we are expecting a lot of more inquiries from potential first-home buyers uh, because of the LPR restrictions changed and the market is changing. So. I think if you listen to the two NICs, there are some drivers which potentially could see some prices decrease. So it depends for the average price where you are in the country. But if you see, for example, a drop in prices, say just to say 10%, I'll pick a number, and the average price is half a million dollars, that potentially means as a first home buyer, you, you could potentially therefore be saving five to $10,000 on your deposit that you need. So the best thing to do is actually reach out to us, have a chat to us about your circumstances, our bankers, our mobile lenders, our homeowner managers in the branches, they can sit down with you and actually work out your situation in terms of how we can help you out and what would be, what would be the right deposit for you. So uh, we remain committed to, to making sure we do that. And just on the LVRs, there's lots of moving parts. At ASB, we can lend people who've only got a 10% deposit. Obviously, the more deposit, the better, but we can lend down to that. And it's on a case-by-case -case basis, so uh, we remain open to supporting you. Thank you so much, Craig. Okay, here's one for you, Nick Tuffley. John asks uh, a big question. People wanting to know the answer to is, should we buy, should we sell, or should we hold off? Well, that sounds like the, the, the really easy question. Um, <laughs> look, it, it does all depend on what your circumstances are. I'll put it in the case of uh, if you don't need to sell, uh, this might be the time over the next little while uh, to just hold on to the house and ride out the dip uh, and you're not sort of making any any paper uh, or any realising any paper loss. Um, if you're wanting to trade up, then obviously uh, if you're selling in a weak market, uh, you're buying a presumably more expensive house in a weak market. So that's not a bad time to, to do that. It's easy to find a new place to buy. It might be hard to sell your, your existing one. Um, on the, is it a good time to buy? Look, I think the thing to be mindful of is that this is going to be a buyer's market over the next little while. Um, what I do expect though is, is that for pretty much the rest of this year is when we're likely to see the, the falls in house prices uh, come through. So you just need to be mindful. It's very hard to pick the bottom in any, any market. Uh, and timing uh, will be a challenge on that front. Um, really down to circumstances, really down to particularly financial situation, job security, things like that at the, at the moment. Um, the last thing you want to do is say, take on a whopping great mortgage and then lose your job the next day. So there are things like that to also bear in mind at this point in time. A question from Pauline for Nick Goodall. She is asking about expectations for availability of housing stock in 2020 and Auckland property values. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, listings are very, very low at the moment, and that is not quite as bad in Auckland, um, but there's not many properties available for sale. We would expect probably that we'll see a lift in listings by September once we come to spring. There might be a little bit of a bump up right now 
um, as people try and get in before winter sets in. But winter is typically not a good time, or many people don't think it's a good time to sell their property. And then we also run into the uncertainty that comes about when we get to an election as well, when many people are unsure about whether they should sell or buy a property. So we may see a bit of a period of um, weakness, I suppose, for listings. But we might, yeah, once we get to September, maybe after the election, and there is some certainty from that. We might see a lift in listings. And so we do see availability of property start to increase, but it's likely that for the foreseeable future, we will see a lack of property available for sale, which will also limit some of the downturn because there's just nothing for people to buy. In terms of Auckland house prices, um, look, a relatively high average value. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to see prices increasing too much when you do have such a constraint on, on demand and many people won't be able to, to purchase at this time. Many people will try and hold on, of course. So you're hoping that people don't sell at a massive loss. Um, and then longer term, I suppose, the appeal of Auckland will still remain very strong internationally. It is really our only international city. And so I think long term, there will be good job growth in Auckland. And that will mean that there will be strong demand for people living in Auckland, which means that longer term, the appeal of Auckland as a city to buy a house um, and to live in will still remain. The key thing is going to come down to infrastructure, I think, and having the right infrastructure in the right place. So people buy properties and can still obviously travel to town and do their do what they need to do to be able to continue to live and work and enjoy living in a great city that is Auckland. Hey Nick, just while I've got you there, um, Mina has sent a, a live question in. She wants to know, do you think that Kiwi build apartments are cheaper compared to house prices in the normal market, taking into account that Kiwi build apartments are so tiny in the area? Yeah, typically they do come in at a relatively lower part of the market. Um, but the difference is not all that much. Um, I think when you look at the median value of those type of properties in, the, in a similar era, area, they're not too different, but they definitely are a little bit below what you typically buy on the market. And they do build them relatively low spec. So not to say that they're bad properties, but they certainly don't splash out on some of the more expensive things that you know someone that was building their own property might you know splash out on a few you know more fancier. Um, fashings and fittings, I suppose, in their property. So there's a good reason for that, and that is to try and keep them low, make them more available to those people that want to get on the housing market. Question for you, Craig. Brian wants to know, has the bank's lending criteria changed post-COVID? Brian, look, we've made committed to making sure that we support our customers, uh, and as part of that, what hasn't changed is a responsible lender, and I put a few in the chats, is making a responsible lender that people can service the loan that they're borrowing from us without going into significant hardship. And so that doesn't change. Uh, obviously some of the income situations changes and we'll work with people on that. Um, and so we're mindful of staying true to that. So no, they haven't changed, but you will find us making sure that we understand your ability to repay the loan uh, remains strong. So uh, we, we're still there to support people with their purchases. Nick, we've had a lot of questions. This is, this is such a good question because this is the question everyone wants answered, please. Home loan interest rates are at record lows they've, uh, than they've previously been. Should we fix or float? Fix for 12 months or longer? Or should I keep my loan floating a little bit longer and see what happens? I'm taking notes as well. Uh, so this is the, the question that I usually get asked at one o'clock at a wedding um, when my advice is at the best and I roll out my 20 page uh, disclosure um, which says I can't really tell you um, what to do. Um, but some thoughts on that when we look, everything depends on people's circumstances as opposed to what is right for them. Um, what I would say is that what is likely to be the cheaper option, what we tend to find when we go through and do all our analysis is generally fixing for shorter term that sort of one to two year seems to be the the sweet spot and the trade-off um, we're in an environment where you'd never say never to further declines in mortgage rates over the next year that will depend on what happens to bank funding costs but the reserve bank certainly doesn't want them to go up so it's kind of a bit of a one-way bet they're either going to remain roughly with our or fall slightly slightly further um, and if you're taking some of those really juicy fixed rates that are on offer at the moment, that's certainly going to keep your debt servicing costs down in the, in the future. There's not much value, it seems, at the moment in fixing for long terms because you're paying quite a price for the certainty. You get lots of certainty, you get lots of sleep because you're not worrying about your mortgage rate, but you are still paying for it in, in that environment. So generally keeping flexible um, or to short fixed terms is generally the, the, the cheaper option. There was a story pop up today and in, in, uh, quite predominantly about the question about whether people should break their fixed mortgage rates. 
your feelings on that? There might be one where I could always uh, see if Craig's got anything to say after I have, but what people got to bear in mind is, is that there's usually a, a cost to breaking your mortgage and you may not necessarily get the benefit of it uh, by then going and refixing at, at a new rate. Uh, so it might be good to just have the patience and have a look. You can always go and get a quote and see what the break cost would be and then see if it's worthwhile doing. But maybe I'll throw that one open and see if Craig's got anything he wants to add. Yeah, yeah good, good question from, um, from the audience there. The, and the, the break costs, we aren't seeing a lot of people change in terms of the break costs, Hillary, in terms of what we, we've seen pre and post COVID. Because it depends on where you are relative to, if you're staying a fixed rate out and you've got the next 45 days, then you'll get the benefit from us in terms of that. If you're somebody who's on a couple of year one, you're in a different situation. What we have to explain to a lot of people is to provide those arrangements, we actually have contracts or other financial arrangements that then to, that actually offset that. And so if somebody breaks, we actually have a cost to incur from that. The bank doesn't make any money out of that. And we think it's fairer, therefore, to pass that cost on to the individuals, which, which drives that, as opposed to then passing that across to everybody. But in terms of whether you should break or not, it really depends, as Nick said, on your individual circumstances. The best thing I could say to people is reach out to your banker, have a discussion about your situation, because we will try and work with you through your situation and see if we can um, make it smooth for you. Yeah, that's a really important message to pass on right now. I've got a question, a live question for Craig Sims now. What is ASB's view on self-employed people when assessing affordability for a home loan, has your criteria tightened up given COVID? Well, that's a little bit like the question before. Sorry, Craig. That's okay, that's all right. So, but it comes down to each individual person's circumstances are, are very different. And so you might be self-employed, but you might be with a partner who's working. So we look at both of the situations if that's a joint loan. If you're an individual, it depends on the type of self-employment work that you're doing. So comes back to as a responsible lender it's incumbent on us to make sure we sit down we understand your situation and are we putting you into a position which would cause you significant hardship through the long term and so in that case it hasn't changed but we will ask people who are self-employed their circumstances so we're not putting them in a difficult situation down the track question for nick what's your outlook on house prices property values where are the regions most affected and what places will be sheltered from any downturn? I think, that, I think that's for me. And actually, I think uh, Nick Tuffley kind of touched on some of this as well. We're certainly expecting, you know, Queenstown to see more pain in the, in the short to medium term. And it is because of its reliance on tourism. All the people that are living there, of course, generally working in tourism. And if we said the big downturn we've already seen and we're going to expect to see, we would expect to see prices suffer more in a place like Queenstown. Whereas those um, places that have a more broad based economy, so based on many more industries, not so reliant on one industry, or it's reliant on other industries, as Nick mentioned earlier, like Wellington, based on the government, or other areas that may be supported by professional health services and similar, then they might be more okay as well. And so some of those regions that are supported by that will be okay, but it's unlikely anywhere will get away scot-free, I'd expect. Um, you know, we're expecting, I suppose, some downturn to some degree across the country, um, but some areas won't see as much of a downturn as, as places like Queenstown, which are reliant on international tourism and will be impacted for longer with the closure of international borders for a longer period. Thank you so much. Now, this, uh, this one's for Nick Tuffley. There's a lot of discussion on negative interest rates. Help us understand what this means for us. How might negative interest rates impact homeowners and home buyers? Okay, so the, the talk about negative interest rates is really at that wholesale level. So when we, that's the Reserve Bank setting its official cash rate at a negative rate. So it's essentially charging the banks if the banks have got money on deposit with the Reserve Bank. Uh, and it's essentially paying us interest if we borrow money off them in some ways. So what that would do is that, that would likely drive interest rates in the wholesale market into negative territory. So that's just effectively lowering them a bit further than what they what they are. So that might mean that our wholesale funding costs, so if we're borrowing money from um, offshore investors or New Zealand fund managers, okay, we might end up actually paying, um, well, they might end up paying us um, for lending us the money, money which um, it might, might sound a bit bizarre, but if that, that could get that, that extreme. But look, in a nutshell, what does it mean uh, for retail um, um, 
borrowers and depositors, it probably just means that the level of interest rates get slightly lower than where it is now. Um, so instead of um, you know interest rates in theory having some sort of base at zero, um, some of those wholesale rates would be able to go negative. That would pull our overall funding costs down, and that would mean um, we would be able to lend money at slightly lower rates than what we are. It would probably also drive retail deposit rates down a bit further for those term deposit rates. That's the flip side of the coin. So at the street level, you'd likely to get at the lowest um, de deposit rates going to zero and no further, uh, and your borrowing rates going down slightly further than where they, where they are now. You're very unlikely to have a, a negative mortgage rate, unfortunately. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people out there who would like a positive deposit rate and a negative mortgage rate. Um, but that's not quite what we are, we're likely to see. But just think of negative interest rates as a way of getting retail interest rates closer down towards zero. Good question has come in here, and I'm not sure who would like to answer it, whether it's um, Craig or Nick Goodall. So pop your hand up and go for it. Um, is it a good time to buy a first home during a time of great uncertainty in our economy? Because, you know, people do naturally have cold feet when they know the economy's in a bit of turmoil. What's your advice to first home buyers over the next three to 12 months? I'm happy to answer that one, Craig. Um, certainly give my opinion on that one. Look, I think that for a first home buyer, you are someone that are buying for multiple reasons. You're buying because you want to have a roof over your head, um, but also for the investment longer term as well. And so if you need a roof over your head, you know, that's not really going to change. So it's really you substituting renting for, buy, for getting a mortgage and buying your own home. And so there's no reason to necessarily put that off as long as you are comfortable, you can continue to afford that mortgage. And one of the key things the banks do is they actually test you at higher serviceability rates. So while you will pay your mortgage at a 3% interest rate, you will likely get tested upwards of five or 6% if that interest rate rose to those levels, that you could still continue to pay that mortgage at that level. So that's the responsibility of lending coming in there. And so you need to make sure that you've got that own buffer. If you are in an uncertain situation and you may, you know, you're considered, you're con considering that you may lose your job or lose part of your income in the near future, then maybe it's not a time to take on a large amount of debt. Um, and, you know, if you are renting, you get the option that you may be able to, you know, move in with other people or move in with parents or something like that. Obviously, you can save some money that way as well. So it is, as many people have said, down to personal circumstance. But of course, you do have the, the emotional reason to purchase, which is that you want to buy, build, buy your own home to live in, potentially to um, you know, modify yourself as well, do the old classic Kiwi DIY. Um, and as long as you feel like you're in a secure financial position, then there's no real reason to put off that decision now. Um, just get out there and see what, what's available, what prices are doing, and whether you can afford to buy in the place that you want to buy. You know. hey, Hillary, just jumping in there. Um, for first home buyers next week, Second seminar is actually focused on helping you with all the tips and things like that. So I would say sign back in next week and we'll give you more information there as well. Have some more in depth. While I've got you there, Craig, there's a question here for you. Homeowners are expecting property values to hold or reduce. I think those figures say to expect a 10% drop. With the removal of the LVR restrictions, what advice would you give homeowners who might be looking to purchase a second home? Yes, I think it comes down to your situation and your circumstances. If, if you've got the confidence and you've got the, you know, in terms of your own employment situation or income area, and you want to purchase another property and it's the right thing for you, actually the, you've got the great opportunity now to reach out to us with some strong uh, low rates that can help you with that purchase uh, situation. So uh, I would say a bit like Nick with the first home buyer, if you're confident, you understand why you want to do that, we're open to talk to you and help you out to uh, achieve that ambition. Thank you so much, Craig. And Nick Tuffley, just a question for you. And this will be interesting because Nick Goodall has also touched on this in terms of the regions, which ones are do doing well. But it's a topic that a lot of people want to know about. If you were to give us a helicopter view of the housing market by region or key market, who are the stand-ups? People particularly interested in hearing about Auckland, Wellington, Queenstown, Wanaka. You, what's your regional overview? Okay, so a few key things uh, what I'll be watching for is we're looking for things that unevenness in, in, in positive um, ways. So if regions that don't have much exposure to tourism are likely to hold up better, regions that won't see much decline in their population growth 
also likely to be areas uh, which are less susceptible to a decline at the moment. So getting into some of the provincial centres like say Hamilton, Invercargill, uh, possibly Nelson, uh, areas like that might be some, some examples of that. Um, places like say Hawke's Bay, uh, you know, exposure to horticulture which is which is holding up pretty well at the moment. So that's, that's a sort of real helicopter view, but I would look at it. What are the things that make that region stand out from its economic performance? Has it got a, a good healthy exposure to industries or is it going to be feeling the heat? Um, and how much is the population dependent on immigration as well? The less dependence on immigration, the more stable and um, um, I, I guess resilient house prices will be. So it's just a really helicopter way of just thinking things through so that people can think about what's happening in their own postcode. Thanks for that, Nick Tuffley. Nick, good all one for you here. Um, an outlook on rental properties in the rental market with a drop in immigration, should we buy or sell rentals? Yeah, the rental market's a really interesting one because we are likely to see um, downward pressure on rents and that would be because we're going to see an increase in the number of rental properties. We will see a switch in some areas, some of the ones we've talked about, Queenstown, Wanaka, that have a large reliance on Airbnb properties and short-term accommodation. We looked at some figures you know, a couple of weeks ago, up to 20% of all properties in Queenstown were listed on short-term accommodation sites in March. And that was similar in Wanaka as well. And so those people that own those properties are going to have to think about what they do with those. If they require income from those and there's no tourists living in those or staying in those Airbnb properties and they require income, they're going to have to push that to the long-term rental market or sell those properties. And if you see an influx in um, the number of properties that are listed for rent, and of course there's a number of people that want to continue to rent, then you may see downwards pressure on rents um, for people, which means a downward pressure on yield. So investors will actually be making less money on those properties. And if people lose their jobs, there's a chance that they actually vacate properties and that investors need to be considerate of whether they can afford to hold that property if there is a period of vacancy as well. So I think that you know the question for investors is gonna be really make sure you're not working on the margins of your affordability. If you, um, you know, need to have that property tenanted consistently and you need rent to stay at the level it's at for it to be affordable, then maybe you need to question that one. If you're okay and you've got a bit of buffer there, then it's probably, you know, again, if you're looking long-term, you're looking for the long-term investment of it and you can have a period of vacancy or a period of reducing rents, then um, you, know, you may be best to hold on for that period as well. So there's a lot going on there, but we certainly think the rental market, especially as it supports things like the tourism se sector, will see a lot more downward pressure than maybe the only occupied um, housing market sector will. Thank you, Nick. There's uh, a live question coming for you, Craig. Can you take us through the bank's policy for apartment buyers? Yes, uh, so for apartment buyers, it's similar to owner occupiers. Where we do look at it slightly differently is obviously the amount. So uh, there is a slightly different uh, level of deposit you need for some of that. Um, if it's an apartment buyer for yourself, then it's just normal with any other, other type of loan. If it's an apartment buyer for an investment, as Nick said, for an Airbnb or a short-term rental, obviously there's different income flows for those ones and we look at the income uh, capability of that and whether you're reliant solely on, say, renting or an Airbnb situation or you're using some of your own income. So really it depends on the mix of what's driving the apartment purchase. Excellent, thank you for that, Craig. Uh, one is coming from Callum. Thank you for this question, Callum. Hi, Hilary. We have found out about the guys' locations, but are you coming live from your walk-in wardrobe tonight? Uh, thank you for that great question. This is actually my office slash study. Uh, I have had to locate myself upstairs in, in, in this room because the family are really, really noisy at this time of night and they're having their dinner. And can you hear anything? No, you can't because I'm so far away from them. So that's where I am. It is not actually a walk-in wardrobe. It is a cupboard, I'll admit it. And that's a sliding door to the outside. Um, but thank you for your inquiry. I'm glad you didn't ask me anything about banking because I would have failed badly at that. So I think that wraps up our questions. Sadly, we haven't got time for any more questions. So I'd just like to take a moment to thank you all, Craig Sims, Nick Tuffley, and Nick Goodall. That is going to wrap up the formal part of the evening, but the Q&A live question function 
just so you know this, everybody who's watching, will be running for the next half an hour. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask, please share those below in the chat functionality, which is there or there. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure to be your host, and we hope that you really found it valuable as well. I think each speaker has given us something really meaningful to take away. Nick Tuffley sharing his thoughts on the wider global and economic backdrop, along with providing some confidence in the New Zealand housing market for homeowners and buyers. Nick Goodall, thank you for going uh, into the detail on the data. And he showed us that although the market has dropped during lockdown, as we come out of that, there has been a spike. It's not quite up to previous levels, but it is a positive increase. And it's nice that we can hold on to that. I think it's fantastic to hear some positive news. And Craig emphasized too that ASB is open for business. When you feel your problem is a small one or a major concern, please do reach out. ASB is there to help and they want to do just that. Now, the great news is we have two more episodes in this series. So if you are a first home buyer, whether you're saving or ready to buy, join us next week, as Craig reminded you of just before, uh, because Craig will be joining us again, as will Nick Tuffley. I'll be there as well, uh, to share their views on the first home buyer market. We're also going to hear from one of our mobile lending managers who will be talking through the process, and Brian Thompson, who's Harcourt's managing director. He'll be joining us as well. And in the third episode, we're going to be talking to our homeowners on all the things that you should consider as a homeowner at this time. So register on the website if you'd like to join us for those. We would love your feedback on how you think we went tonight. Remember the Prime Minister's words, be kind, especially to the host. Um, you'll receive a survey to share your thoughts. And please know ASB is here to help. So click through the survey. You can also request that someone calls you back if you want to have a chat about something. Uh, one of the members of the ASB team will be happy to give you a call. So our guest speakers and I will be sticking around, as I mentioned, for the next 30 minutes to respond to some of your questions. Do feel free to stay online. Put your questions in the Q&A box. I'm looking forward to it. I hope there aren't too many tricky questions, especially for me. Enjoy your night. Cheerio. We'll see you next week.